Hi everybody, thanks for coming out tonight. Um, this talk's part of the Labrador Institute Speaker Series that we started last February, I guess. We kind of took a break during the summer, but uh, from now on, I guess we're going to have probably a talk every month over the coming until springtime. I guess we're going to try, I'm going to try and line it up with the, the season of the Interpretation Center because they have a number of talks up there in the summer, so we'll fill in the space when they're not open over the, over the fall and winter. Um, so Stephen Loring from the Smithsonian is our first guest speaker this year. I'm happy to have Stephen here. Uh, we've uh, known each other for a while now, haven't done any field work together, I guess, but uh, I've talked about archaeology back and forth quite a bit. And uh, so I'm very happy to have him here tonight to talk about uh, his experience of working in Labrador, and I guess more specifically tonight about working with young people in Labrador. Um, so without further ado, I'll give you, I'll give you Stephen. <laughs> My second Scott's appreciation. Thank you all for coming out this afternoon. Um, it, it, I may be a little disjointed getting started, only because um, uh, we just <laughs> flew in last night. Um, uh, Chelsea and Tony and um, uh, Marcel Ashini and uh, Richard Nuna were conducting fieldwork up in. Uh, uh, just over the height of land in Quebec, actually, we snuck out of Labrador to go to Quebec, um, and we're right at the headwater lakes uh, into the George River, um, and uh, this is an area uh, of interest to me, but uh, we had planned a, a month of field work, and so I just, uh, this is just uh, yesterday evening, um, our, our landing uh, on one wheel, I was very impressed. Um, doesn't want to land on the top of the escrow lands on, on, on the bottom. But um, this last summer, this field work that we were doing was based on the work of this American adventurer, William Cabot, who came out to Labrador at the turn of the century. Um, and uh, he, he, he was very interested in the, in the Inu traditional way of life. Um, and he went up to Voices Bay, where today was in there. Well, he was how you get into the country. Uh, he took his canoe, followed the Inu Trail back up uh, 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 west of Voices Bay. Uh, here, climbing out of the Kugaluk uh, River Gorge to get up on the barren lands, uh, which he then crossed to find the Inu at their traditional fall caribou hunting places. And one of these places uh, in the background here um, was a camp in 1906. And when uh, Mr. Cabot was there in 1906, uh, the Inu had just speared hundreds of caribou, and uh, their tents were all along the place where the figures are standing in the background. And uh, we were able to locate the actual tent that's standing here, the remains of it. Um, and uh, that was the focus of this work. That was the plan, anyway. And uh, here's a picture that Mr. Cabot took in 1906, and look at the islands in the background. And here's the same place. Uh, today, and it, this sort of gets to this notion of um, the, the connectedness of people in the past, you know, and so, um, you know, descendants of the people that were in the picture, uh, in this case, Richard uh, Nuna and uh, Michelle, or um, uh, Mr. Ashini, um, were, were, you know, able to occupy the same place uh, that was photographed and things. And so there's this connection, the land remains, um, you know, generations pass, and yet there's a very strong attachment. And one of the things that I hope to get to in this talk is just talking about this connection that people have, could have, should have, with with heritage and with the past and the importance of that. You know, we're always looking to the future, um, but there's so much to be proud of in Labrador, so much um, history and, and so many accomplishments, you know, of, of ancestors. And, and that's a little bit of what archaeology hopes to celebrate as we sort of rush headlong into the future, uh, remember where people came from, remember those values um, that made the past, uh, that, that made people today. Um, so um, we documented a number of interesting features and, um, and then woke up last week to this. Um, so. <laughs> It was very hard to, um, and I kept scratching my head. Geez, I've been, I've been in this country 
uh, much later in the year that it hasn't been quite as snowy as this. All the ponds froze over. Um, uh, we would look out and sort of argue whether we just need to dig down through a few centimeters of snow or whatever. Um, but the archaeology becomes awkward at best. Um, and so you can see the fireplace in the middle of this picture. Um, so we ended up uh, getting picked up and um, uh, here now. So that was just a little segue of where I came from uh, this most recently. And I, uh, if I hadn't thought about it, maybe I would have tried to make more of a lecture uh, about that field work, but maybe another opportunity will afford itself to do that. Um, the talk I wanted to present this afternoon, this evening, um, is, a, is a little bit about this real transition that's taking place in archaeology and anthropology. Um, it started out in the past, the archaeologists arrived, you know, they jumped out of the airplane, they landed by parachute, you know, they gathered up the artifacts and they raced back to their respected institutions. Um, and, and that's really changed. It's been a real watershed in, in, in archaeology and anthropology um, that really recognizes the responsibility that researchers have to working with the community, sort of like just sharing the information that they have. Um, so I and 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 I so I come from the Smithsonian Institution. Here's the original building. Um, this is my picture of the uh, the day before the Obama um, uh, inauguration, and this, this porta potty is lined up for miles <laughs> you know, on the, uh, the street. But anyway, it's an August institution. It's the it's the National Museum of the United States, um, and uh, actually the big working from the Smithsonian in Labrador since the 1880s, and it, from the 1860s even to that eclipse. So I wanted to talk a little bit about this notion of, you know, and, and uh, um, museums, uh, uh, universities, you know, everybody now sort of recognizes that um, traditional um, landowners, traditional um, um, communities have a legitimate right and responsibility to participate in the creation of their history and it, it, for a long time native people in america in the united states felt really ostracized from the museum you know these are the white guys they come to take our stuff they put it in the museum on it's not in the community anymore and repatriation has really turned that around Repatriation legislation <clears throat> in the united states um recognizes that certain classes of artifacts you know um, sacred property, burials found with, with burials, things like that, um, need to be returned to the community from which they came. And that's brought lots of, um, of uh, groups of native peoples to the museum to look at our collections, to work with us and, and, and document the collections from their own indigenous perception, their own point of view. And it's been an extraordinarily enlightening process. And, you know, I think the museum was like this kind of dead mausoleum you know, in the 1990s, and it's just been radically transformed by opening the doors to people from the communities, people, you know, that have a legitimate heritage interest in the things that their ancestors made. And it's been really enlightening for me, and we've had uh, uh, lots of people come. And um, this is a group of Inuvialuit from the Mackenzie Delta, um, and, you know, this is not the Smithsonian has all this old clothing, you know, it's sort of like, it's the day-to-day -day garments that people wore a hundred years ago. Um, but it's, it's, it, you sort of wear it and you throw it away because you make a new one, you know, and it's only the sort of, the, the, the museums that have stored some of these things, kept the bugs from eating them, uh, preserved them, conserved them, that sort of have been able to retain these things. And now Northern Native peoples are coming and from, um, from Chechichi, uh, Jody Ashini came down a couple of years ago um, and worked with some of the Inu clothing that's, that's in our collection. So it's, 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 it's been really exciting. And, uh, these um, opportunities bring um, elders from the community with young people um, to sort of get involved in heritage related uh, issues. So that's kind of a background. I just want to say that I think times have changed. Um, and, and, and more and more this notion of working, so trying to, to go to communities, listen a little bit to what they have to say about their interest in the past, and then try to um, sculpture, try to uh, design research projects that would be a benefit and of interest to the communities. 
a little bit of background on myself. I first came to Labrador in 1975 as part of a project um, with an archaeologist at the Smithsonian with Bill Fitzhugh. Um, we had the old RCMP boat from uh, Hopedale, uh, uh, which was found here on Birch Island and sort of painted it up, took it north, put a new motor in it. And then that was our research vessel for many years. <clears throat> here we are at the old dock in Postville. Um, had to move out of the way for the Bonavis, and it's okay. Um, and uh, uh, when I was doing my graduate work, uh, sort of in the early 80s, most of it was centered in the Voices Bay area, uh, between sort of Nain and Hopedale. Interested in looking at the evidence for um, early uh, Inu ancestors. So. Um, this is a you know a, a big shop of a big ceremonial feasting house, a fireplace in the middle of the house near Daniel Serrato, near uh, Natchez today, and our work that we did in the 70s really sort of laid down the framework on the history of Labrador, uh, deep past. So we were you know we, we we began to find traces of of ancestral Inu. Um, uh, and Paleo Eskimo and Inuit people uh, all along the coast. We were able to build the initial building blocks, you know, based on the kinds of tools they had and the kind of houses they had, um, and begun to build a framework which a lot of the history of Labrador has been directed on since then. In those days, in the late 70s, well, yeah, mid 70s, um, we thought we were like really incredible adventurers, you know. We had our little funky boat, you know. We were off in the first boat north in the spring because we could get inside of the ice. We could get around Cape Harrison. We could scoot up to Maine, um, and you know the big boats would be outside. They'd still be stuck in the ice. So we we, we felt we were uh, uh, brave adventurers going where nobody had been before, um, you know. But you, know, you bump into William Anderson, you know. It's good. <laughs> Or, you know, kids in Ocock, you know, rowing their boat out to get some fresh water ice. And um, it became apparent, you know, first of all, as archaeologists, we'd be out of business if nobody had been there before, because then what are we doing? Um, but uh, this, this little seg segment of slides sort of gives <clears throat> a kind of a transition into to archaeology, because I, I spent the winter of 1977 between Nain and Davis Inlet uh, in a little cabin and would go hunting with Inu and with Inuit uh, friends. Um, and it really was a transformative experience for me because it was sort of, you know, you dig these stone tools up and you try to interrogate them to get, you know, tell me about the past. You know, things were different. Um, <laughs> but if you sat down in a tent with someone who'd just been all day out of the Sheena or at a rattle sort of fishing or hunting seals, uh, you got a much more uh, provocative and much more insightful and interesting picture. Plus, you got all other kinds of stories that would come through besides what people ate and what they did. And and so I like the sequence because here's some, um, you know, here's an Inuit tent, um, rocks holding the tent down from blowing away. Um, the hunting equipment is nearby. The dog is looking for scraps. Um, if you go back in time. Uh, there's another source of information. It's the historical records in the Moravian accounts, the Hudson's Bay Company records, um, old photographs, Mr. Cabot's journals, like 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 I mentioned at the beginning. You know, and you get another picture. So it's just still the same picture. You know, there's um, you know there's a tent held down by rocks. There's a dog off to the side there, um, but it's a little more evocative in the sense of what life was like before. The total influx of European materials and equipment. So the skin, you know, they're still living on the land. Um, tents made out of skins. Uh, but then along comes the argue, you know, you go back a few hundred years more. The dog's gone. The people's gone. The old photographs are gone. Nothing is left but the um, the ring of rocks and the few pieces of trash that might have gotten left behind or broken and abandoned. And that's all that's left for the archaeologists to try to interpret uh, the rich uh, history in the past of, um, of, of, of Labrador. So that's a little bit of the, the dynamics that we have to go through. Um, I was infatuated with Labrador just because of the opportunity I had as a young man to, uh, to meet people that had grown up in the country, lived on the land, 
um, and, and, and their knowledge and insight was uh, quite provocative and profound for me. Um, and then the opportunity to go hunting um, and see, well, you know, it's not just going to the store to get supplies. If you're hungry, you have to cater. Um, and that was a really learning experience for me. So that's sort of the background on what I, where I came from. And, and I did some archaeology, and I did my dissertation, and I, I, I did all that. And then when I got my adult-type job at the Smithsonian, um, I thought, well, now I'd really like to do something with us working community of coming back to Labrador and working um, with people in, in communities and sort of trying to tease out what was of interest to them and and and, and try to work towards a archaeology that was uh, more closely entwined um, with uh, community interests. And I came up one winter and I went to a number of the different communities on the Labrador coast um, and so sort of made presentations to the town meetings and, and just, you know, what, what was in archaeology and, and really had a wonderful time in Makovic. Um, and the people there were very interested and said, okay, we'll give it a shot. We'll see what happens. <clears throat> and we started a project with uh, Jill and um, a number of other young people from the town, which to me was very exciting. And, and uh, we just, we, we had a good time. So I wanted to share a little bit of that with you this evening. Um, in thinking about, um, well, um, the, the site that we we did most of our work at is a place uh, called Long Tickle, Avivik Islands, um, and it's it's about 30, 40 miles south of Makovic on the way towards Cape Harrison. And when we found this site, we visited it back in the 1970s, and at the time we scratched our head. It was it was kind of a southerly site for us. This is before Lisa Rankin did a lot of her work further south and realized there's quite a lot of Inuit sites all the way down the coast now. Um, but we thought of this as kind of a, a, a southern site. <clears throat> it's just north of Cape Harris. And my theory when we started this site was that if the early Inuit, and there's a lot of problems in the 18th century with the Inuit and the Europeans raiding each other and um, um, getting um, um, kidnapping each other, killing each other. Um, uh, there's a lot of violence, a lot of confusion about what people's roles would be. And we wonder if people at this site might have gone down to southern Labrador to raid the European stations, the fishing stations, and then come back late in the fall, uh, get around Cape Harrison, uh, and then set up, and then here's where they live. Um, and then in the spring, when the Europeans came back to southern Labrador and found their fishing stages burnt down and their iron gone and the things they left behind stone, they might be pissed off, but they'd have to wait. They'd have to make that decision about, do we wait for the ice to clear off Cape Harrison and lose a lot of time, or do we just count our losses and, and go to work? So I was very interested in this site um, because I thought it would be a, an early window into um, that kind of time period, sort of before the Moravians, um, when uh, the Inuit were already dealing with Europeans, but pretty much still in their own terms. And, and I think people in Makovic were interested in it because it's in their backyard, and um, people used to have fishing houses out here, um, and uh, surprised that there was a, a site there. So here you see the, um, the sod house, one of three um, that were, were at the site. And, part of the environmental conditions that you have to deal with sometimes. It's like, well, I don't think we're going to Makovic this afternoon. <laughs> um, the people that lived in these houses, the Inuit people of Labrador, um, descended from uh, Siberian Inuit people that came across to Alaska, and then around uh, 12, 13, 1400 AD, at a time of global warming, um, were able to take, there was less ice in the high Arctic, the whales that they had become adapted to hunting were able to move into the Arctic and the Inuit followed them and very quickly spread all the way across the Arctic to Greenland and down the coast of Labrador. Um, and to me, part of the astonishment of the Inuit adaptation is just how successful and how capable 
uh, people were uh, when the opportunity afforded themselves uh, itself to uh, to to expand into these new niches and to take this knowledge and these skills they had of living uh, in remarkably challenging climatic conditions and extending it um, across across the Arctic. Helped, no doubt, by the Umiak, you know, this big skin boat, which, you know, <clears throat> it just amazes me, you know, how much gear, how much, you know, stuff you could get into these boats and how adept these ancient mariners were um, at um, maneuvering the coast. They were whale hunters. We know that both from a few artifacts um, that show a uh, whaling uh, depicted on it, but also from in the high Arctic, um, from the remains of the, the, their old houses. Uh, the land without wood, um, all the structures, the, 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 the rafters that would form the house would be the, the ribs of, of the whales they were hunting. And you enter these house um, uh, uh, past uh, uh, giant uh, whale skulls. Uh, you see one uh, whale skull buried nose down. There's another one from the question. So you're living in a house um, this is important, I think, you know, for northern hunting peoples, you know, you're living in this house, you're basically living inside the body of the animal that you're hunting. And part of what fascinates me about um, Inu archaeology, and I'll come back to it when I get to that part of the talk, but this, this pervasive notion of the relationship, the, the, the intangible relationship between hunters and their prey species and how closely entwined people's imagination um, and spirit are, were, with, um, with the animals. It's just, it, it, it's so at odds with the way we think of the world today. And yet, I think such a profound way of being a human being, you know, that you experience your relationships with the animals, with place, with other people. The, 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 the boundaries that are much more porous and interconnected than we are today. It's like we have animals, we have people, you know, and, you know, we have houses and we have um, our places of work, you know, and I think all that was sort of blended together in a profoundly different way. That is why we became human beings, you know, and I just keep going back and say, why do you, why are you so much interested in people in the North? It's just, that's where, that's the last vestiges of, I think, of what it meant to become human are the, is, 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 is experience in this kind of landscape of, of the imagination between animals and humans. Then along come the pesky Europeans, um, you know, in 1700s, you know, they start coming down, the, or much earlier than that, but there were 1600s, um, the Europeans show up and encounter um, the native people that, that are there. And the, the first Labradorians uh, kidnapped and taken to, to Holland. Um, it sets a bad relationship, you know, the first time you meet someone, you just grab them on your shoulders and, and, and take them away. It's sort of said, well, next time these guys come, we'll treat them differently. Um, so there was this really complicated period of uh, Labrador history um, that sort of comes to a, a, an end in the 1770s with the arrival of the Moravians at Nain, and that sort of transforms uh, the whole relationship of the Inuit uh, uh, to um, uh, two Europeans. Here's the, the first mission site at Nain, um, with the sod houses still in the background, um, and that sort of uh, uh, begins a new chapter in Labrador's history, which I'll spare you today. So here we are um, at, so, so go, to go back to Makovic, back to Long Tickle, um, <laughs> We, uh, we were interested in this period just before the Moravians came. I, I kind of scratched my head sometimes and wondered if the people that live at um, Long Tickle were the very people that murdered the first uh, uh, Moravian missionaries that, that, that came. They may have been, they may not have been, um, but uh, it, it, they certainly knew who did it or they were, 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 were of that same larger group. Um, but to me, the you know, if you're an archaeologist, you, you spend a lot of money, it costs a lot to do field work. You can come up, some archaeologists would go through a site like this in, in a year and then we're done to go somewhere else. Um, but our goal in this project was really to sort of try to engage folks in Makovic 
uh, with the practice of archaeology, with thinking about archaeology, and also the opportunity for young people to get back on the land. And I think that's been the driving factor for me for the last uh, two decades. It's really been trying to create opportunities to get people to be on the land. Because if you don't have land experiences, why should you value it? You know, it's like, you know, it's nothing to us anymore. You know, our, our focus is in town. You know, we're, 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 we're urban, we're village dwellers now. So a really fundamental sense of getting back and, you know, and that was an important aspect of it. So, so here we are, here's a big sod house. What do you do with it? Um, you start, uh, uh, you dig in front of the house and, 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 and you can find um, um, deposits. Uh, and here, that's, that's how thick the deposit is. So five or six winters, we're never sure of just how long the site had been occupied, but good, good period of time, enough to build up all that refuse that you see uh, in the picture here. Um, and so why do archaeology? Um, it's entertaining, I think. <laughs> Chico can respond to that. Um, but what I liked about archaeology in the project was it builds on certain, you know, you go to school and they, they teach you math, they teach you reading, you know, do this, do that. Um, and and it's, it doesn't have any practical value. Um, but you get at it, a lot of archaeology is measuring, you know, drawing, mapping, and, and conceptualizing um, the, the, the um, you know, you know, taking reality and sort of converting it to um, to uh, to maps and drawings and things. We had a project where uh, somebody was responsible uh, at the end of every day of going around to all the different excavators and sort of asking them about what their uh, experience of the day had been. And so we had this kind of running journal, so people had to write, and they took that responsible that was responsible. Um, and and so it's an opportunity to sort of. To, to understand science, to understand, you know, what, what, what do the bones say, what do the artifacts say. Uh, so it's a good learning opportunity. Um, I also think it's a lot of fun, you know, and, and we, we McCovic worked so well for me, I think, for us, um, in that we worked really hard, um, and this is a critical factor, I think, you, you know, we, we, we worked really hard, we had a week of work, and then we could go into town and get clean. Um, it's asking a lot to be out for like a month or two months, you know, some of these projects. Um, and and I, I think I think it worked really well because we were able to scoot back and forth um, as opportunity allows. And it was a very productive site. It was an exciting site to work. Um, it still had a tremendous amount of uh, of Inuit technology, um, whale bones, sled runners. Um, uh, uh, ivory uh, tips for your kayak paddles, so when you are pushing your kayak through ice or something, it doesn't break off, it doesn't um, spread up the wood. Um, this is a harpoon <coughs> uh, finger rest made out of ivory, walrus ivory, and then um, knife handle fragments. And, and interestingly, the beginnings of European materials, so um, an iron blade set in a knife, a little glass bead, and um, a little lead trinket that would be sewn on the bottom of women's parkers. And uh, the big thing, you know, we had a good time, but we found a lot of nails. You know, <laughs> nails aren't necessarily the most interesting thing to find. So it's like, well, what's going on with these nails? Um, and I think it builds into my argument that these early Inuit groups were going to, because iron was so special, uh, and they were going down, they were stealing nails from these European places, um, and then hightailing it back up north. So you take your nails, you can bang them down, you can make uh, deer spears and harpoon heads out of it, you can make ulu knives out of it, um, and you can make uh, knives, you know, bone handles that you can bang out and, 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 and make your iron knives. So um, uh, very desirable. Um, but also, uh, you still see traditional um, Inuit uh, style technology. So, so, so lamp, you know, here's the corner that we found, here's what it would look like. I'm sorry, a kettle, soapstone kettle, and it would be suspended above the soapstone lamp. The seal fat would be here and get a nice um, fire going, keep uh, cook your kettle. But, but delightfully, we found these, these are little tiny miniature kettles and um, 
attempt to live in nature. And they're toys, you know, archaeologists. If it's small, it's an amulet, it's magical, it's a spiritual thing. I don't know. You know, if, if you're the woman in the tent, or in the, in the, in the, uh, in the sod house, and you're sitting by that, that lamp all the time, adjusting the flame, cooking the food, keeping the place warm, doing your, your, your sewing, and you've got a couple of girls, you know, sort of sitting there, what are they going to do? You know, they're going to want to play, you know, they want to do like mom. Um, and these things, they show up at, um, at, at almost every Inuit house that gets excavated, these little toy pieces, I think, um, that uh, the little kids can play with while, um, while mom is doing her work. And we have a couple of little, I don't think I picture it, we have a very little tiny harpoon head, which I, I, I just imagine some little boys going around and stabbing the dog and driving it. <laughs> Um, you know, are they are they amulets? Are they magical? I don't, I don't think so. I think they're toys. Um, we found artifacts like this broken bottle, and bottle shapes change through time, so we're able to um, to uh, get some idea of, of uh, what it looked like. And this is what it looked like when we were done. I'm sorry, I did that automatically. Um, uh, uh, large communal house, uh, stone floor paving. Um, uh, we found places where there were three, uh, where two uh, blubber-soaked rocks uh, where lamps had been. So we think there were two families uh, sharing this house, um, and uh, that gives us some idea of you know how many people were living there, and uh, and this is probably something what it might have looked like when it was was occupied. Uh, important aspect of any kind of community project, we think, is, is trying to get some of the older people in town involved and knowledgeable. And we had a couple of visits by the elders. We try to get a visit out every year. They'd come out, charter boat, bring them out. And uh, it was great to have them at the site because they could often provide interpretations about features that we'd be scratching our head about, sort of, well, what is the pile of rocks? Oh, that's, you know, that's where you store your seal meat, it's right outside the door, you know. Um, so they always had, had wonderful ideas. I think everybody enjoys getting out and, and, and getting out on the land. Just a few pictures of Molly. Um, we had, um, <laughs> the first year I came, I brought a lot of freeze-dried food. And the parents in town saw me taking their kids out <laughs> in a boat with boxes of freeze-dried food. And uh, they're not going to eat that. Um, and and uh, the next day, somebody came by, oh, we're just driving by the neighborhood. Here's has some, has some char. Has some, some, you know, and then a few days later, oh, we're just driving by. Here's some, some caribou in case anybody wants. Um, but uh, we also set a net up, you know, so we were able to catch our own fish, and, and it was really sort of as much, you know, uh, being out on the land was such an important uh, aspect, I think, for everybody. And then the fellowship, it's like, Stephen's making spaghetti tonight, okay, well, we'll give it a try. It was good, we, we, we survived. <laughs> um, and rainy days led to um, our sort of thinking about uh, um, what life was like for the people that lived at the site. And so we imagined a story about what people uh, did and we, we, we th this led to a publication that we're all proud of, I think, um, that starts with kind of a story about what life was like on the, on the island at the time that people lived there. And it's published both in Anuktitut and in, uh, and in the English. And, uh, this, and then the story is followed by a sort of a passage on, on, on archaeology, on sort of how what we did informed the story. And uh, it, it worked out well. Um, and, uh, and this is, um, I don't know what this is. This is just, <laughs> this is see no evil, hear no evil, speak no evil. Um, but uh, we had a lot of fun. And I think that's an important part of a, of a good project is just, um, is this transition from a, a, like those the disappearing tent rings, you know, the, 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 the history, the oral history, and then finally uh, uh, the project, the, the book that we did got a, got a history award, so we were quite pleased with that. Okay, and then briefly I want to talk a little bit, so that's sort of one project, and then, and then the other project I want to talk to you is about recent work with, uh, with, with, uh, with Inu. Um, and and, uh, and, uh, and and some of the 
directions that that goes into. It's the same idea of sort of trying to work with community interests and talking about heritage in, in the past. Um, when I was doing my dissertation work, uh, David Zinnett was, was still a, a viable community, a viable community. Uh, people still lived at David Zinnett. And it was apparent that um, if you wanted to talk about country ways, um, you didn't go to the houses so much as you go to the tents in the front. And, and the people would, was, would still had a strong connection to the land. Um, and, and I was, you know, I was young and impressionable and, and, and quite taken by people's knowledge and their experience, their life stories, their life experiences. Um, and just have had tremendous respect for um, their hunting life and, and, and their ability to live on the land that for so many has seen as harsh and, 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 and difficult. So I was stunned, as I think many people were uh, in Canada, by the imagery that came out, you know, in the in the late '80s, you know, with the with the, the fires and the in, uh, in Davis and that, um, and and I just and people kept saying, "You work there? What's going on?" And and I and I didn't have a good answer. I you know, I mean, I, there's economic issues and social issues, that, but uh, I just given the extraordinary respect I had for uh, Inu ancestors and 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 the the skill and the lifestyle that they embraced, I was surprised at the depth of sadness that, that many people in the villages were experiencing. And I wondered, you know, then and still, um, if there's a role for archaeology, you know, to sort of work with people from the communities to get, um, to get people out of the land, to sort of try to convey some um, respect some sense of entitlement that people have or should have uh, to the country that really was the land of their their ancestors and to some degree uh, their land as well. So there have been a number of projects that we've done over the years working with uh, young people. Uh, we did a project in 1992, I think, um, out of this building, I think, we worked in this building, um, as a Pathways project. And we went up to um, uh, just out of town here, where the uh, Crooked River comes. No, or, no, it's just after the Crooked River, where the I think the Red Wine River comes in. The Portage Trail up up to um, uh, Pocket Knife Lake and around the rapids of the Muskoka up to Seal Lake. And you find this old trail in the woods, and it's it's like an interstate highway. And and, and the trees are grown all around, and yet you see how all the branches are, are, are clear. You can almost just put a you know, family with a canoe on their head, sort of walking through this, um, this forest. And the, the ground is depressed from the generations of Inu and, 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 and later uh, trappers are using this old uh, portage route. And to me, that's an amazing artifact. And I think the group that was with us thought so as well. It's just like, it's a very tangible demonstration that uh, generations and generations of um, Inu had traveled this route. And indeed, um, William Cabot, the, ex the man from Massachusetts that was up here in the teens and 20s, um, he traveled this route with some Inu families from um, Sheshachi, came up to Northwest and went up with them into the country. They used this trail, so his photographs uh, document um, uh, the use of the trail at, 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 in, in that time, and here it is today. And we did a little archaeology project there, uh, which was, again, it was uh, uh, an opportunity to start, begin to uh, uh, expose people to what it is that you can do with archaeology. You know, it's, 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 on the, it's, it's out on the land, we camp, uh, we, we camp with our ancestors in camp, we look for, for relics. The thing here is there's been some noise in the brush. Um, what I like to say about um, Inu archaeology is hunting always trumps the archaeology. Um, so if, if, if there's something for dinner, suddenly uh, everybody's attention uh, moves away from uh, their digging. Here's um, Richard Nuno with a, a fishing lure that we found at the site. Um, Mr. Cabot uh, traveled back into the country uh, in 19... 6, 1910, and we were able to visit the same places we found the very rock that he had been um, uh, uh, lunching at. 
and uh, here's a group of young people that we had up at Dev Canvas Dust in. Again, we're, this is site surveying. We're, we're looking for old um, uh, archaeological sites, but if a partridge is very too close, um, it was dinner and um, put the archaeology aside for a moment. I've also had the chance to work with some Inu leaders, Daniel Ashini here. We, we did a project at Smallwood Reservoir uh, when it was at a low stage uh, uh, to go and look for old Inu uh, camps and uh, burial grounds. So it's just it's the beginning of an awareness that uh, um, Inu leadership as well as Inu youth have as an opportunity to get back uh, to the country. And more recently at Camus Dustin, where Chelsea and I have been lucky enough to work, um, we've been in the country at times when people from Nakashish have come in and uh, shared their knowledge about uh, stone tools and the archaeology that we find. And I always like this picture of William um, laughing as he talks about uh, spearing caribou when he was a young man. Um, archaeology uh, is an opportunity to be on the land. It's also a way of um, getting, you know, people that are sort of very skilled at, at uh, following game trails and looking at subtle signs and differences. And the, it's, it's putting another filter uh, and provides a, a kind of a time depth, kind of a, 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 another um, way of experiencing or, or thinking about the land when you, when, once you know how to look, once you know how to, to see these old sites. And we found traces of sites going back um, uh, 6,000 years uh, in, in the Kamasasan region. So there's a, a, it's a continuity uh, from that time distance almost up to the present day of, um, of sites. But here's just um, three Inu colleagues um, totally disgruntled at um, my predilection for square holes in the ground. Um, Mosquitoes were bad, and it was okay if it's not what to do. But I just close with this slide and the next one, which is just sort of, again, so we've come back to the theme about what should archaeology be for or about and to whom. Um, and if we can't make our archaeology interesting to the descendants of the people who produce the remains that we're finding, um, I think there's a failure there, and, and a, a lot of the work that we're doing now is trying to create opportunities, trying to find ways that, that uh, communities, and schools, young people can get interested in the past and go on to explore it themselves. I think it was very successful in McCovic. All the people that worked with us on the project have gone on to university and to various kinds of jobs. It's been less successful in the country um, with uh, with any young people because there's there's not um, the kinds of sites that can really hold attention for a long period of time you know there's just a, a sparse scattering of things but uh, it's something to work on and, and to think about but any opportunity that gets people into the country I think is what's um, what's important so if we go back I'm, I'm sorry see if I can go back to that slide um, uh, if I end this with the way I began, which is sort of to go from um, the historic time period, 1906. Um, whoops, wrong way now. Um, so we go from the contemporary tent to the historic period tent to what the archaeologists find. Here's a collapsed tent that's about 150 years old. The wood is still there, but it's rotted away. Um, to a site that's maybe a thousand years old, the wood's gone. It's just a stone hearth is all that's left. Um, and, 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 and that sequence going back in time. And I just, uh, I think I just have my last slide, which is uh, when the, the Summer Olympics were on and um, all the Inu kids at uh, Cummins Dustin were in the pole vaulting. Um, <laughs> but, but I thought if we could make um, archeology span as interesting as uh, some of the media events to which they were exposed, um, we'll go a long way towards fulfilling our responsibilities as archaeologists. So that's my talk, and thank you for coming. And I'd be glad to entertain any kind of questions if anybody had any thoughts on that. Good. Thank you. Um, 
up here. So come up afterwards. I think uh, Scott has coffee and tea, or we can sort of chat if you want to do it. But thanks all for coming up. Appreciate it. Thanks, Dia.